when we approved the conditional use and they were asked to come here and answer for why that hasn't happened. So I don't know that we would have been provided documentation. Um, my point is, I guess, is uh, what does that have to do with our planning commission? It's, it's really an enforcement issue uh, with the administration. But it's not because we can actually withdraw the conditional use because they have not met the requirements that we set out in order for them. Yes. I'm sorry. I just I I understand where you're coming from, Larry. I just I disagree. I mean, there is comes a point at which time, if an applicant doesn't submit the required information, there's not much staff can do to force someone to do something. And this is the body, one of the bodies that helps in uh, in those decisions and those deliberations. It's entirely appropriate for staff to say to the planning commission you know we have have them come back in front of you and present something and and uh make a determination as to how you wish to proceed my my point mr chair was that and it, it, i see it seems to be it's not our uh, it's not an enforcement issue by the planning commission to take the, take this upon us so then who who's it is, i i completely i do disagree with you um i believe it is when we uh when we do make a motion with conditions and none of the and those conditions have not been followed and met and it has been 12 months uh, it is certainly within our purview to request the applicant to return to our board at which time we can make a determination whether or not to continue that conditional use or whether to revoke that conditional use um, that certainly is within the purview of the Planning Commission to do so they, they um, you know the the operation of that facility uh, there were quite a few things that needed to be met, um, including material lists and such that, um, you know, I, I just, when, when this board asks for something to be done, it, it should be done. And if it's not done, uh, this board should have every right to recall them. Yes, sir. All of the, and I don't disagree with you, all of which has not been provided for tonight. This has been over a year. Mm -hmm. All we received was minutes from a year ago. Mm -hmm. None of that has been refreshed. We may have different, I don't know if we have different commissioners at this point. I don't know. But I would also like to hear what the uh, planner, is, his opinion is on this. Certainly. Patrick? Sure. Um, the 
uh, subject uh, property was approved for the use uh, roughly a year ago. And um, looking at the record of that time, it was the expectation that uh, within the year following the site plan and special land use approval that uh, the applicant would have come back to the Planning Commission with a final site plan with all the details. And so at a previous Planning Commission meeting, uh, the topic came up in terms of you know, where are we with, with that uh, property and with that use. And uh, the Planning Commission decided to uh, go through the process of uh, reviewing whether or not um, the special land use should be a current. And the first step of that process is to hear from the applicant, uh, hear their side of it to see what's going on. And if it's something that's dealing with the property or for some reason they haven't come back, uh, we want to hear those reasons uh, in an open meeting and, and discuss it. Um, if an applicant has not taken any action, doesn't intend to take any action, uh, then the Planning Commission can take the next steps in terms of starting to revoke that special land use. Um, so that, that's the process. I think by being here tonight, I think the applicant is willing to engage with the Planning Commission and provide an update, um, and, and we can start that process whichever direction we end up going in. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Through the Mr. chair, Roman? I, I just want my point being made that you said yourself with all the details, which we don't have, there's nothing other than a year-old minute I will send a motion to entertain the conversation, but I, I don't. I would like us not to con continue to make a decision or anything further tonight, if that pleases all the commissioners. Yeah, I, I don't know that this board is ready to make a decision tonight. Had the applicant not been here tonight, that may have been a different situation okay. story. But um, point point made. I'll rescind my motion. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. So. Um, Mr. Chair, yes. I hope that in the future that we get something more than at least year-old minutes, at least some kind of synopsis from the administration, a summary of some type. Mm. We may have different members. Not all the details were made known not only to us but the public, so I think it's, it's not correct, but I rescinded my motion. Thank you, Mr. Roman. Uh, Thank we'll, you. we'll note that. Ms. Tick. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Roman has a point. I'd like to see something as well on what conditional, what part of the conditional uses have they not met so that we know what we're looking at. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Sloan and uh, Mr. Fink and I will make sure that uh, if, if this type of an issue does come up again, we will make sure to have more information in your packet for you. Uh, so uh, that motion uh, is withdrawn. Uh, the agenda has been approved. Yes. Did we call for the? No. No. Um, there is a motion to approve the agenda as amended. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, first call to the public. If you'd like to address the board, please step to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. You do have three minutes. Mr. Gordon. Here we go. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Chairman Dignan, rest of the Planning Commission, good evening. Um, the excitement of the primary election subsided a bit now, uh, and the movement is toward the general election just a few months away. During the primary, um, Trustee Janet Chick, who's running for re-election, and Commissioner Marlene Chockley, who's also running for supervisor, uh, campaigned on your pride in writing the master plan and adopting it, and your respect for the master plan, which calls for more than just development. I was hoping between now and the general election that you and the Planning Commission might do something about farmland and natural features preservation. We've, not, we've got a new planner now. Welcome, Mr. Sloan. It's nice to see you. I've been impressed with your presentations that I've watched in the last month or two since you've been on board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I was hoping that if goals and objectives have been added to the agenda this evening, maybe you could uh, loop Mr. Sloan in to help uh, design a process for achieving them. Uh, the Downtown Development Planning Group is busy with the possible waterfront park, which is great, and I hope that you can also turn your attention to an equally popular goal of farmland, wetland, open space, and natural feature presentation. We've seen, all seen how popular the waterfront park is, how community involvement becomes much easier when you work on projects that the people want. When I look at the goals and objectives, I see 11 goals listed, 
from one of your documents, and uh, the first four are all regarding growth, discussion of business-oriented zoning, discussion of Main Street concepts, land use analysis to see what the community would look like with a build-out, density of agricultural land, talking about reducing five acre to two and a half acre, all designed toward development and growth. It's not until we get to number five that we talk about an agricultural survey. Number six is purchase of development rights. And the very last item, of course, is taking a scenic vista inventory, which I would have thought would be part of those mm. items a little bit higher in the list. I'm not sure that this, uh, these 11 points uh, represent what the residents want. Um, maybe they can all be accomplished or at least worked on at the same time. I'm convinced that large, preserving large tracts of farmland would make our community more attractive, not less. All the communities around us are doing it and it's paying them sharp dividends. Please start working on this project. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how well your efforts are received. There are lots of residents who would jump at the chance to make this happen. I am one of them. When you talk about representing all the residents, I hope you keep in mind that the rural residents are only about 30% of the population in Northfield Township, but we're paying about 60% of the taxes. It's about time the Planning Commission and Board started doing something for us and something that would benefit the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Anyone else? You're, you're right on there, 10 seconds left. Mr. Warburton, welcome. Yeah, it's a bad thing when they recognize you by name. My <laughs> name's Craig Warburton, I live at 450 West Joy Road. I'm not sure what I really want to discuss, and I'll do it very briefly, is a planning commission issue or a township board issue, and it relates to a request that came from Driftwood Marina to have parking designated for his purposes in the lot at 75 Barker Road. And while I would give anything for this guy to be successful and get that marina up and do what he wants to do, um, you have no idea how much I believe in what he wants to do. I'm not sure that the municipality can designate parking spaces to a single um, entity, to a single merchant. Um, it would seem to me that with, with the, um, what's the name of the, um, the new property? Got the name of it. What is it? Van Curler property. Some of that comes right up behind the businesses along Barker there. Um, you certainly could create a legal obligation that the lot at 75 Barker Road would be nothing but municipal parking and commit to the merchants in this town to provide them with places for their customers to come and park and make an environment for them. I think the, 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 what he's got planned is going to be incredible. You know, and you know, we go to the bowling alley, we go to the Coney Island, and a lot of people don't even know we have a Coney Island. Uh, but you gotta have a place to park, you know, so that's my only comment, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Warburton. Anyone else that would like to address the board at this time? Seeing none, we'll go on. Uh, I don't believe we have any clarification from commissioners this time, unless anyone else, no? Okay. Ms. Chockley? Well, um, yes, uh, uh, a land preservation committee is something that I am very interested in, and it got on our list. But the clarification is that we voted, I guess, and the goals are ranked based on everyone's vote, um, which that's, that's why we're taking them probably in the order we're taking them, I assume. Um, but that doesn't mean that some of us can't do things on the side. So. Well, and my, my intention We'll have a further discussion about it down, yeah. down, down the agenda. I've got some thoughts and, and uh, processes along that line that I'd like to talk about. So, Thanks. Right, yes, Ms. Chick. Yeah. I, I think a lot of those items on the goal um, list also would be, uh, imbue a, a conversation on land preservation. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be part of every one of our goals, most of them anyway. Right. Thank you. All right. Uh, next correspondence, which uh, I have none. Uh, public hearings, which we have none. Uh, reports on committees. Uh, Board of Trustees report. Ms. Chick? Um, the Board of Trustees met August 9th. Um, there is a downtown planning group that requested funds for a Van Curler ribbon cutting ceremony slated for October, as long as the closing happens before October. Um, civic event application for the homecoming parade and the road closure was approved, and the People's Express contract was approved for 2017. Um, and then the Van Curler survey, this might be of interest to the Planning Commission, mm -hmm. revealed an easement, and they're not sure if it's a utility or otherwise, but it's being researched. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you. Any, any questions for Ms. Chick? Seeing none, ZBA report, Ms. Right. Chunkley. Uh, we did meet on August 15th and we approved a variance uh, for a proposed lot split resulting in two parcels on um, East Shore Drive. And the, the reason it had to come before us because, was because the width to depth was greater than what the, um, the state allows in their ordinance. And um, the applicant did everything he could to minimize that um, inconsistency, but um, we felt that it was appropriate to allow him a lot split. So uh, we did approve that. Um, we had a second gentleman come before us who was looking for some guidance on whether he should um, be required to get a survey of his property because um, a, an addition had been put onto the house that infringed into the side yard setback. And it wasn't exactly clear from property boundaries based on GIS what the edge of the property was. So um, we re we're requiring him to get a uh, stake survey of his property to make sure that that's appropriate. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Trockley. Any questions for Ms. Trockley? Seeing none, staff report. Anything from staff? Nothing, sir. No, nothing? Planning consultant report. Nothing. Nothing at this time. Okay. First item is unfinished business is Goya Leasing Incorporated of 1451 North Territorial Whitmore Lake uh, 4189. Uh, phase two of the site plan summary. Uh, I assume you're here from Goya. If you'd like to uh, step to the microphone. Um, the board has requested your presence here. Uh, because uh, as you heard earlier uh, we did request you came before us about a little over a year ago now and uh, we'd given you conditional use we just had not had a status update we weren't from my understanding from staff there just wasn't a whole lot of uh, movement on that and we'd like to ask you kind of where you are with the project and and where you will be going and kind of a time frame that you have laid out so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and if you could give us an update Sure. I, I'm, I'm Todd Pasco with Atwell, and this is Ryan Steele. He's the owner of the project. Um, so back when we got our conditional use a year ago, it was suggested that we incorporate everything we think we might be doing on that conditional use plan. So there was multiple things on there that were no, noted as, as phase two or phase three. Uh, phase one was to move into the site, clean up the debris, uh, fix up the buildings. So the update on, on phase one is uh, you know, building, building, a. <coughs> building a has new siding. Uh, there's new electricity ran into the site. Uh, uh, building A is continuing to be renovated. Building B siding has been purchased for. Uh, the site's been the site's been cleaned up. Uh, so there's a fair amount of work been going on. And then the, the second part of that was uh, Ryan hired a consultant to evaluate the pavement that's out there. So we had G2 Consulting come out and do soil borings. Uh, and, and in reviewing that pavement analysis in in groundwater conditions, <coughs> we've sort of determined that this building has really been set too low in the ground when it was built. So I'm kind of moving into phase two. Phase two is what changes we'll be making to the site. Um, and phase two before included more storage area, more landscape bins. So, so we're at a point where there's three things that are continuing to be evaluated to determine a layout. Because ultimately we have to have a site layout before we can create the site plan for phase two. And those three things are, is determining what will happen to this building. Um, uh, the second one is sanitary sewer. Sewer exists on the other side of the railroad track from us. Um, Ryan's been in discussion with the railroad company about an easement to extend that sewer. And we have to further evaluate the cost to do that. Because if sewer comes to the site, that impacts our layout because the septic field and system would then go away. Um, and then the third item that impacts our layout that, that Ryan's also been working on is 
is the railroad spur is reactivating that existing railroad spur. Um, so, so all those things are moving on along with the, the phase one items of fixing up the existing buildings. Um, so with that, we're here to, to answer any other questions. Um, I guess, let us know. Yes, Ms. Chockley. Um, can you refresh our minds on exactly what you are doing there? Um, and I know there's a lot of trucks out there. I don't really see much else, and it's, you know, and it's still looking in the very beginning stages of being, you know, cleaned up. The, the, there's not landscaping along the front or anything, so it really looks like an indust very industrial in the front. So I'm just wondering, what, what are you planning to do on that property again? So it's currently a trucking facility. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the conditional use was also retail, and that's not happening at this point. But at some point it might, the retail? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It will, it will happen, okay. Yeah. And I know we did get a list of materials from you mm -hmm. a long time ago, so that, that should be somewhere in the, in the office, and it yeah, was that, acceptable. That was done prior to going to the board. Right, because yeah. we, okay. we, we required that, and, and it was acceptable. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you reactivate that spur, what, what kind of things do you anticipate bringing in on railroad cars? Okay. Well, if we had a site plan, it would be easier to visualize what you're intending to do there, and, um, and we could get more excited about it. And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, Sounds like you're working point. on that. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're working on that. So, Okay, that's all my questions. I, I have a question for Mr. Sloan. When you have a project like this that has um, a, a very long-term final site plan type scenario, how, how would you recommend that be handled? Because obviously, when when long periods of time, you know, occur without updates, I mean, uh, certainly there's a long-term vision for the property, but I mean, how long do we carry out, uh, you know, conditionally the conditions of a conditional use to to, you know, in reality be implemented? Uh, typically, what we like to see is a is a final site plan approved early in the process. Um, that allows us to have a record plan and gives the uh, applicant and the township some assurance and some predictability of what's on site, what's approved. And then um, if it's built into the conditions or on the site plan that certain things can be modified, they do it within, within that range that's approved. Um, or if they can't, then they can always come back later to amend their conditional use permit. Um, so in terms of a final site plan, we like to see that just earlier in the process, just so that we've got something on file and they're, they're ready to go with things without uh, things hanging in limbo. Um, like for example, the three things that are noted, the Northeast building having a determination on that, um, they can show the building on the final site plan and then if they ever demolish it or modify it, they can come back for an amended site plan. Um, with the sanitary sewer, um, they, depending on where they can get it from, they could show the existing line and maybe a proposed area but if there's any change in it, sometimes you can administratively move a sanitary line without having to come back to the Planning Commission. And then finally, uh, reactivation of our railroad spur. Um, if they know the location, they could show it on this plan and say, we want this approved, and should that ever be changed or modified, uh, again, either do that administratively on the site if the ordinance allows it, or come back for an amended site plan review. So um, there's always a chance to come back and. For the applicant to say we want to amend our site plan we want to amend our conditional use permit uh, things like that happen all the time especially when you have a, a use that's growing 
that doesn't know perhaps what uh, its needs will be in the next one, five, or ten years. But um, things like that usually shouldn't hold up a final site plan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sohn. Mr. Fink? Okay. And, then, and then we'll go to Ms. Jack. Um, this is just a, um, my experience for your, uh, for your, you know, benefit. Um, in a former community, we had lots of problems that where this came up, typically more on the subdivision side, housing subdivision side. Um, the Planning Commission started, typically in, in Michigan and, and in other areas, you have a preliminary site plan and a final site plan. And there's a point at which uh, a lot of codes will indicate how long of a time period you have after preliminary approval to final site plan approval. Ours doesn't exactly work that way. Um, but that being said, they started really getting, the, the code called for six months. I believe there was a six month extension that can be given by administrative staff. Once a one year mark hit, the planning commission was requesting um, the individual come in front of the planning commission for, um, for uh, uh, a review and, and within uh, between one and two years, there was revocation of, of the uh, initial preliminary site plan because they failed to follow through the final site plan. I would encourage the Planning Commission to look at a set time frame. I think it's a, a good policy. I think you should build in a little bit of administrative um, extensions given extenuating circumstances. This particularly became a massive problem around the recession subdivisions and developments that got started in 2008 and 2009 when site plans were created and nothing ever came about in terms of development whether it be retail or industrial or residential and they would just sit and sit and sit and the developers would come in and ask for an extension um, so uh, it's a really good um, question and you should sort of set some time frames and we can look to other communities as to what those time frames are but usually it's it's between one and two years with uh you know between six months and a year depending on the community and how flexible they want to be with a cutoff point an administrative uh, extension and then it goes in front of the planning commission for potential revocation the one thing that i would note um and uh um and and it's not to belabor the point, but it's to go back to the original conversation of why we're hearing this today is because the reason why this becomes more than just an administrative enforcement issue is if there is a potential revocation, there's also a potential shutting down of a business. Um, and that's a pretty significant uh, step uh, in the process. Um, and those steps are steps that I don't take lightly. Um, and so, um, uh, that being said, um, you know, in, in this particular um, conditional use application, um, I believe there were some things that uh, the gentleman sort of had at rights that he could theoretically pull a building permit because uh, I believe, if I recall correctly, some of the uses were in line with the zoning. And then there was also some conditional uses on top of that that were related to some of the future phases of his project, if I recall correctly. Um, so for the, I know I'm, I'm speaking a lot, I apologize, but for the next meeting, what we really need to review is the precise conditional uses that, um, that were required um, of, uh, of plans uh, and uh, if there are any uses that were permitted at right and what the Planning Commission's purview would be to uh, revoke that, and then uh, if you choose to do so, what the applicant's rights would be there on out. Thank you, Mr. Fink, and Ms. Chick, and then yes. Mr. Roman. <clears throat> so Building A presently is, is functioning as a business, a trucking business, correct? You're, you're working out of that bu building right now? Yes? Well, uh, the, yes, okay, so Building B um, is the one you want to have a landscape business in. What is your timeline for having that up and running? as a business. If you could step to the microphone so the folks at home can hear you, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Like Tad told, told everybody we have the siding purchase. We can't hear we can't you. Hear. I don't know that the can you hear me now? Just, you just have to put it really close. Just go and take it out. Tap it? Yeah, just go and take it out. There you go. Can you lift it up? 
like Todd was telling you folks, that we have purchased a siding. It's already bought and paid for. We plan on starting that in the spring. Spring. Residing it. My goal um, is to get the whole road frontage in pristine condition by the next fall. Okay. I want to make it look good from the road because I don't want to be a blight. That's my goal. Right. So two th fall of 2017. Yeah, before oh. winter of 2017 okay. rolls in, I want to have the whole front of that, both buildings looking good, and then we'll move on to the other stuff after that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Chick. Mr. Roman? Um, yes. Um, I don't know who can answer this. Is is there a certificate certificate of occupancy issued or do they have a temporary certificate of occupancy and a question i guess to the planner do they need one and if they should have one do they uh, regarding a certificate of occupancy uh, to be um, operating and open to the public um, typically they should in terms of what they're allowed to do in the meantime while they're working on a building, usually they won't have a certificate of occupancy because it's something that they're working on. So um, the specifics there, I would defer to the building inspector in terms of what they can and can't do with that occupancy uh, permit. And I don't know if they have a certificate of occupancy or not. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. Mr. Roman? I'm, I'm assuming they don't, but um, a temporary certificate of occupancy could be issued. And at that point, Possibly bonding on future work or whatever the case is. Um, this has been, I drive past this place numerous times a day. I live nearby. I don't honestly see a lot of progress on the site, I'll be honest with you. I also see vehicles of yours for sale in the front, um, parking in the front. Um, I just don't see a lot of progress. Doesn't it put the township at a liability for them to be there operating without a certificate of occupancy? Um, I, I would I would ask the the building official in terms of what uh, a landowner and an occupant can or can't do without a, a C of O in terms of you know what the responsibilities are uh, in terms of the progress uh, being made. Um, the applicants have so many days after the approval of a site plan um, to. Uh, to get work done. In some cases, when construction takes longer, it's usually no big deal as long as they're working on it. You know, the certificate of occupancy, that's something that has to be determined. That, that's my point exactly, Mr. Chair. Um, we haven't gotten to an end result with a site plan. They're in there operating. There's liability to the township. There's no certificate of occupancy. I don't know how they're covering anything with insurance without a certificate. There's a, there's a lot of different issues. The township being one of the liabilities on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. That is the hammer to get something done is to not be using the building or the site to get the end result. So I guess if Mr. Fink can't answer it, I guess it's a good question that I mean, should probably be answered sometime soon. We, we could answer it if we wanted to just go downstairs real quick and figure out it. Huh? There's not a CFO. Because you have a temp, temporary CFO. Huh? And we'd want to, let's double check that to see if it's in, uh, in yeah, let's just go, if you don't mind, Mary, if we can double check that in the, in the records. It'd be fine. And you are correct, Mr. Roman, if he doesn't have uh, a CFO, I've had actually a conversation with Mr. Wyland and uh, on this very issue, uh, on the CFO of this business, and um, I, I, if, if, if I speak wrong, I, I, you know, Mr. Wyland can correct me, but I do recall Mr. Wyland indicating, you know, that he was aware of it and he had the ability to be in that building because he could have just pulled a building permit. So, yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, to Mr. Fink, pulling a building permit and having a certificate of occupancy are not even close. No, I understand that. What we have is, is a business operating fully functional, no certificate of occupancy. There's liability to the township. You just said yourself, the building official is aware of it. I don't think it should continue. That's my opinion and my past experience. But 
the whole thing's a bomb waiting to go off. So that's my opinion. Um, right. That's it's my conversation thing. with it. You know, Mr. Mr. Frank? You know, um, Commissioner Roman, I, I mean, th this is precisely the reason why these things come back in front of the Planning Commission. If the Planning Commission is not seeing any evidence, they have not been communicative with staff, we can't force somebody to do anything. If the, if the Planning Commission wishes, go ahead, Mr. Roman. No, you have the floor. No, please. Mr. Roman? That's a, that, that was my point initially with this even being on here. It's the administrative end's responsibility to, f to, to do any enforcement action to, in to ensure zoning compliance, to ensure building code compliance, to ensure fire code compliance, to follow up with that. And, and I disagree with you that this in any way has anything to do with the responsibility of the Planning Commission tonight. Thank you, Mr. Roman. I, I think that this, this is brought to light an issue that we do have, and, and, and that, that issue being is how, how we get down this road. And I guess the question is, is um, you know, we want people to come to Northfield Township to build businesses to succeed in Northfield Township, but there, there are some things in place that have to be followed, and we have to make sure that uh, were covered, not only for uh, the township's protection, but the residents and, and uh, honestly, the, the applicant's uh, protection. Yes, Mr. Oh, Roman. Just going to uh, make a comment regarding your statement. There, that's, you're absolutely correct, and there's avenues to pursue that, one of which, of which is not this, the purview of this body, but rather the building department or the, the zoning administrator so forth, or the fire chief, numerous. Uh, either one of or many, but that is an avenue that needs to be addressed and taken and, and Obviously, this is one of the scenarios. So I hope we don't have it More in the future. That's that's You know my point bringing all these items to light. Right. Thank you. Well, fortunately and unfortunately We have not had a lot of site plans come before us. <laughs> I mean I wish we had a lot more but um, Yes. So Let's how check. can we make a decision on anything if we don't have any the administration following through on um, the necessary documentation? Or what I would like to see us do is to set some clear parameters for when we would like to see a final site plan. The, the enforcement stuff is something that needs to be dealt with administratively. But, you know, as our planner stated, we can see a site plan we can review a site plan and we can determine whether to approve or not approve a site plan and that site plan can be revised later if necessary such as you know the applicant doing soil borings finding out that a building is lower and, and, and those kinds of things um, what we haven't seen from this applicant is a final site plan and with a final site plan approval correct me if I'm wrong um, and the right progress, a temporary C of O can be issued. Is that correct, Mr. Roman? Absolutely. With stipulations, even. I, I understand that. Beneficial to the township. Right. And the public and the surrounding community. And, and my point is, is that I want to make sure that we're able to get you to a place of compliance, a place where you're operating and you're operating within the, the ordinances and the, the rules of the township that that that's because that protects you protects us and protects the, the citizens of the township so you know I, I don't know where you're at with preparations to present a final site plan if that's a 60 day 90 day uh, item it's something that I would highly encourage you to work with the planner and stay in regular communication with the planner about that process and, and you know get that done so that can come before us the other stuff administratively that the office deals with they have to deal with um, and you know I think it's been brought to light here and uh, I think this Planning Commission would like to have staff report back to us on on how they're planning to address those things in the future I think that's that's definitely something that's important uh, the only thing I would ask is mr. Sloan if there was any thoughts concerns to that process that you see is, is my thought process accurate is that something that you think is reasonable yeah definitely there's uh, two separate uh, uh, 
uh, processes. One is the, the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission's priority uh, as a body is to uh, ensure that the, the site plan is proper. And then on the administration end, it's uh, ensuring that um, you know, all the building permits are pulled, they have the certificate of occupancy. Um, having said that, uh, those administrative items uh, rise to the level of the Planning Commission when uh, things are ongoing or there could be potentially a violation of the site plan approval because sometimes this comes back to the Planning Commission if they have to consider revoking an approval or um, trying to uh, head off something that they see happening where an amended site plan should be filed. So even though you know, we, we should be getting into final site plan just so that we can close that loop, um, we'll keep one eye on the administrative ends of things just to make sure that things are moving along in accordance with the site plan and try to anticipate anything that might come back before the Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. And, and I don't want to discount any of the progress that was made on the site. Very early on, there was significant progress made on the site, and, and we recognize that. And, and I don't want to discourage your business from operating. We want you to operate. We want you to flourish. We want you to be very prosperous in, in our community. But, but we do want to make sure that these things are dealt with and dealt with in a timely fashion. So um, with, with that, I don't know that we have any any business on this item other than um, unless other commissioners have a thought on the expectation of when we would see final site plan before us. I mean, yes, please, Mr. Iquinto. Yeah, I first would like to apologize for my tardiness. It was unavoidable. Sorry. Um, but I think you, you did ask and you looked at the applicant. I think we can clearly make a motion this evening to ask for this item to be addressed within a time frame. You looked at the applicant and asked him, are you looking at 30, 60, 90 days? I would not like it to see any more than 90 days because then we're getting into a winter period and more of an avoidance issue, I believe, if it's longer than 90 days. But I believe that we can make a motion once we hear from Mr. Fink to have this item addressed within a 90-day period for a final site plan review. Because otherwise, we're just putting it in limbo again, aren't we? Thank you, Mr. Iquinto. Ms. Chockley? Yeah, I'm not really sure exactly where we're at even in the process, and I, I would like some more information before we say, okay, you've got to come back in 60 days or something. And if we have, um, I mean, there's a conditional use that's been approved by us and the Board of Trustees. So we wouldn't be revoking their conditional use. The Board of Trustees, is, that's something that they would have to do. Then we saw a site plan, and that's pretty minimal of a site plan, but does that qualify for them to be able to do a lot of work on site? You know, I would, I would like more of a chronological um, order of what's, what has actually happened here and why there's been no progress because supposedly they're not supposed to be doing anything if we don't have a site plan. My understanding when we allowed the conditional use was that we had something like that and it hasn't changed in a year. That's so well, we I allow just got a preliminary site plan as well. I, I yeah. just got off the phone with Kurt Weiland just so everybody kind of takes a step back. Number one, I'm not the building official. So Mr. Roman, I don't sign a CFO, and you know I'm not, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I'm not in charge of the building official. Okay, um, the building official allowed Goya to operate, and the reason why that allowance was made to operate because I just literally got off the phone with them, and I mentioned this in the beginning of the meeting, but it sort of it kind of went to the side. The use didn't change. So under Kurt's opinion, they had the ability to operate and be in that business and continuously pull building permits to rehab that business. There was no use change. It was a retail business before, it's a retail business moving forward, the zoning was correct before, the zoning was correct moving forward. Now maybe this is something that you know, our new planner takes a look at. But, and 
That's the reason why Kurt felt as that was appropriate for them to allow them to operate. The conditional uses were on uses that were in addition to what their initial business model was. And so if those uses are occurring that were part of the conditional uses, then we have an issue. But again, I mean, you know, I, I really, we, we, can, we can tighten up our procedures here, Mr. Roman, but I really don't think that this is a situation in which staff or administration is sort of not following through on enforcement. Kurt's decision was to allow them to operate, and that's his choice. Now, I had concerns about it back then. I still have concerns about it now, but that's his choice. So I don't, I, I really don't know where a lot of some of this is coming from. Thank you, Mr. Fink. If you could address your comments to the chair. Mr. Iquento. Uh, Mr. Chair. So, so with hearing that, again, I don't ever see a reason to interfere with the building official. We, they don't even need a site plan. Well, them. They, is, yeah. is that correct? Um, if there's a change of use, they need a site plan. And the planner at the time identified that there wasn't a complete change of use for all of the issues that came in front of the Planning Commission. That some of the uses were the same and similar and some of them were different. And the uses that were different required, if I recall this correctly, which was just about a year and a half ago, some of the uses required a conditional use permit and others did not. If there's no change in use, and there's no expansion of the building, they're not required to come in front of a site plan. Now, they did come in front of a site plan because their site plan included multiple uses for this particular project. Now, if those uses are not followed through on, then the Planning Commission can revoke the conditional uses on, on, on those details. Okay. I, I I'm going to go back to Mr. Roman here. I, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep it very short. I find it hard to believe you're not in charge of the building official. You're the township manager. I don't, I'm not looking for finger pointing who's, who's to blame, who's to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not after that. I'm, my point is specific. There's obviously a, a, an administrative improvement that needs to be made for the sake of the township, for the sake of the planning commission, for the sake of everybody involved. So I'm not gonna sit and dispute uh, who did what and what decision was made. It's, it's really not my, tr it's, I don't care. Thank but you. we are where we are because of how it's being handled. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. You. Thank you, Mr. Roman. I'm gonna ask Mr. Sloan uh, to give us a, uh, some kind of a synopsis opinion on this. I mean, in, in, the, in the case that's been laid out here with what they're doing and operating, they're operating as the business in, in accordance with the way that it was used prior to them moving in. So they're not using it on any of the uses that were uh, requested under the conditional use at this time. At least that's the presumption. Uh, with that being the case, they actually don't need us. Do, do they need a site plan? or do they only need a site plan once they are <coughs> intending to use the property for those conditional items? Um, they, they had uh, conditional use approval last year from the Township Board of Trustees and it was recommended by the Planning Commission with conditions. Um, they also had uh, an approval of a site plan uh, that had conditions on it as well. Um, it was the understanding of the of the planning commission that they would be coming back with a final site plan, a final version of everything that is to be done on the site, not necessarily everything that they have been doing. Usually, uh, the way it's supposed to go is you do the site plan and then you and then you start building according to that site plan. And so, uh, over the last several months, that's hung out there in terms of the planning commission. Uh, expecting a final version of a site plan that it can approve and memorialize 
and uh, activities going on on the site. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, I think, between uh, getting that final site plan and the Planning Commission being done with it and what they're allowed to do on the site. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that's anything that we can resolve tonight based on the limited information. Uh, but I do think that um, for the sake of getting the site plan finaled out, um, I don't think there should be many holdups to filing that final site plan, completing the information that's required on a fi final site plan, and then getting started with that process just so that we can close that loop and you know, start to move on to uh, other things. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. I'd like to ask the applicant to come up for a moment because I have a question for you. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. My, my question is, is if we were to ask you to present a final, final site plan to us, would that be something you would be able to do within 90 days if we are asked you to? So, so if we were going to do a final site plan within 90 days, it would be an existing conditions plan, which was a part of the original site plan. All these ancillary items that affect layout, we're not, a, we're not in a position to answer in 90 days. So... So I, my question, is a final site plan required if we're just using the existing conditions? And that's a question I'd defer to Mr. Sloan on. Well, um, if, if it's existing conditions, sometimes um, a site plan has to be filed just for the sake of having a uh, plan on file that is approved. Um, even if there are no changes, an existing conditions plan is at least a good thing to have so that you've got uh, topography, dimensions, layout, uh, if there's any nonconformities, you can identify those and figure out if you want to get those nonconformities into compliance or let them be. Um, that's the process of going through uh, the site plan and, and looking at the existing conditions. But um, I, I see the difficulty that the applicant has in terms of trying to figure out uh, what the future holds and how to put on future development and uses if they don't know uh, what will be happening yet. And uh, in that case, uh, they either don't show them because it's premature or um, they, they show what they think that they're going to do and, and try to get a little bit of leeway there in terms of, you know, um, if there's locations of places, try to identify an area where things will be located uh, just for the sake of having something. Uh, but one of, the tr one of the troubles that we would run into if we don't have a final site plan is that you know, this could take months, maybe even years, to figure out what the plan is for, you know, the future development of the site. And meanwhile, if there's any development going on that's perhaps not on the final site plan, there's really nothing to hang our hat on to in terms of what the record site plan is. Okay, I'm just looking over a letter dated February 24th, 2015, um, from Kurt Weiland. Uh, Letter states, I have completed the review of your zoning compliance application for the above reference property. Any change of use of the property, even if the change of use is a permitted use, is the subject uh, in the subject zoning district will require the application to go through the site plan approval process. You will need to complete a site plan application and have the site plan prepared for the property. The site plan process manual, which describes the process, and required steps is available at the township website. Uh, the change of use of, a, of the structures under Michigan Business Building Code will require a building permit and construction documents prepared by a registered architect. Let's just see. The two front buildings closest to North Territorial are approved for merchantile use with accessory inventory storage. All other buildings were approved for S1 storage building for building materials, including lumber storage. The proposed trucks parts storage, or sa parts sales store would be consistent with the merchantile use and was approved in the, two front in the front two buildings. Adding the truck repair in the same building creates what appears to be a mixed use and would require the code review by a design professional. Even changing from lumber to truck repair will require a building code compliance review for the design professional. Yes, sir. You had something? Um, yeah, just a, just a point of clarification, because I think that's, I think what we're trying to understand, too, is the conditional use plan that was done over a year ago included a site plan. So, and that, that preliminary site plan. It included a site plan. It was a preliminary, so, I, so, though. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking 
the part of the confusion is what is that site plan? That says site plan two, it doesn't say final site plan. Um, the question that we have is are we required to submit a final site plan if we're not ready to do additional work on the site? And that final site plan, in my opinion, would just be an existing conditions plan, which was a part of the conditional use plan. I mean, the previous planner identified in their report that the uh, warehouse storage and maintenance shop uses are listed as permitted under use in the GI, General Industrial Zoning District. However, retail sales of items that are the same as the items sold at warehouse in the premises or are related by use or design to such warehouse items provided that a total amount of the retail sale shall not exceed 25% of the annual wholesale sales on the premises is listed under conditional uses in the GI district. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm going to have one more comment and then I'm going to refrain from Go saying ahead. anything further. My um, recollection of this whole process was the trucking was allowed, the sales and retail component were the conditional use part of the project. And that's and I had conversations with Mr. Wyland on this, and he felt as though that that component of the use was permitted. Mr. Roman. Mr. Chair, this is exactly why I thought this may not fit our agenda. There's obviously more written documents that none of us have purvy to. I think uh, at this time, I'd like to make a motion that the applicant or business owner get with the uh, planner and Mr. Fink and decide appropriate future steps and time frame and come back to the Planning Commission. Support. Oh. <laughs> There's a motion by Roman supported by Aquinto. Discussion on the motion. Can I would like a time frame to be added to that to meet with them within 30 day period. Is that realistic? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Iquino, how do we know what how much time the applicant needs or the, the business owner needs? I we don't know that or there may be other specifics that come up in, in their meeting with with the planner and, and the administration. How do we know no, just that we require them to meet within the 30 day period because if we don't put any time frame it could go out six months a year. I understand right? what you're saying. Though. That's my thought process. That's true. Motion to amend. I, I would just make an amendment to that that they would meet within a 30 day period to come up with that plan. A support. Okay, okay. there's an uh, amended motion. Uh, the amendment is that uh, 30 days be added as a time frame for the applicant to meet with the planner and staff. Uh, is there any discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, let's make a, a, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Amendment passes. Do, any further discussion on the motion? Okay, so the motion is that the applicant uh, work with staff and the planner uh, within the next 30 days to determine the next steps necessary to move forward. All those on, oh, yep, Ms. Chick. Sorry, that uh, before it comes to the Planning Commission or when it comes to the Planning Commission, again, that we have all documentation in front of us so we can research it. I, I would expect that staff would continue to give us updates on that and where the progress is and the, or the planner. Um, and then when it's ready to come before us that the prepared documents would be provided. Perfect. All right. No other discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. We do appreciate it. Yes. Thank okay. You. We do appreciate you doing business in Northfield Township very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda is considerations of recommendations for use and development standards in the ES Enterprise Service District and storage of materials. Uh, with those items, I'm going to now turn it over to Mr. Sloan for, for uh, a review of his uh, 
attached uh, memo. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read off of the August 11th, 2016 uh, memo that uh, we prepared regarding this matter. Um, at the July 6th Planning Commission meeting, uh, the Planning Commission discussed a memo dated June 29th that included considerations and recommendations for uses and development standards in non-residential zoning districts. Among those recommendations uh, was to address uh, whether to have certain uses with outdoor storage in the Enterprise Service District. Uh, at the last Planning Commission uh, meeting where we discussed this on July 20th, uh, the Planning Commission looked at the Enterprise Service District, um, generally located between um, Horseshoe Lake and Whitmore Lake on the west side of Main Street, uh, just east of US 23. Uh, we had discussed proposed amendments to the ES district, which are enclosed in the packet. Uh, those uh, are dated June 29th and have not changed since uh, they were originally drafted. Uh, those amendments um, include making certain contractor supply uses with outdoor storage as conditional uses in the ES district. Uh, there are several other changes uh, within that that we can get into, uh, but that was the major one. Um, Contractor uses uh, are allowed in the district, but it does not currently allow outdoor storage. Uh, so that proposed amendment would allow outdoor storage, but it would be only as a conditional use and go through the conditional use process. Uh, furthermore, the amendment states that the outdoor storage requirements would be subject to sections 36-701 and 702 of the zoning ordinance. So at the July 20th meeting, the Planning Commission requested that we review those regulations and prepare a recommendation for how modifications to those standards would be appropriate for the ES district. Um, after reviewing those outdoor screening regulations, um, we had first considered um, having regulations for our screening of outdoor storage that applied just to the ES district because there are some districts that have screening uh, that's particular to their outdoor storage. Uh, however, after reading the general standards, um, we recommend that the general regulations um, be modified or that uh, a, an amendment be considered to the general regulations, uh, which would apply not only to the ES district, should outdoor storage be allowed in the district, but to all districts in the township. Uh, so in a moment or two, I'll get into some of the details of that proposed amendment. Uh, Currently, uh, section 36-701, uh, subsection 4, uh, requires outdoor storage areas to be screened with wood or masonry materials at least six feet in height, uh, which means that all outdoor storage areas must be surrounded by a solid wall or a fence. Um, there are a few uh, issues that we have with uh, requiring this in all cases. Um, the first is that um, although solid walls and fences ensure immediate screening, uh, they can become unsightly if they are constructed with unattractive materials or improperly maintained. Uh, we see this all the time with uh, wooden fences that rot or uh, masonry walls or concrete walls that, that crumble and start to heave. Um, and another issue that uh, uh, we have with walls or fences at least six feet in height is oftentimes they don't screen anything above. So if there's uh, a use um, 100 feet away, you can still see over the wall, and uh, if the piles or activity is higher than six feet, it's visible. Or if the topography around it is higher, you're looking down, and the wall and the fence has no effect. Um, so instead of the requirement for the fence and the wall, uh, we recommend instead that uh, evergreen screening be installed for outdoor storage instead. Um, Specifically, we recommend that a staggered double row of evergreen trees at least eight feet in height and spaced 15 feet on center at the time of planning be required around the perimeter of all outdoor storage areas. Um, and currently the text reads that a wall or fence is required and the Planning Commission has discretion to uh, require evergreen screening. Uh, we recommend doing something a little bit opposite where the evergreen screening is required and the Planning Commission still has discretion whether or not to approve a fence or a wall. Um, although planting trees uh, like this won't have the immediate screening that a fence or wall does, uh, over time it not only encloses itself to provide that barrier at six feet, but as it grows together you get a barrier even higher. So depending on the storage of materials or the topography, the long-term solution is that you get much better screening and it's much more attractive looking. 
And then um, we also recommend, as part of this amendment, that the Planning Commission have discretion over the height of the materials stored. Uh, whenever the Planning Commission is reviewing a request for outdoor storage, one of the requirements should be to know the, the height of the piles that will be being stored because ultimately that will impact uh, the effectiveness of the, the screening that's uh, going to be required. Uh, the final item that we, we note in the subsection is that um, it does allow the Planning Commission to waive or modify evergreen screening requirements where there is existing vegetation that can be used to fulfill or supplement the requirements of that uh, subsection. And then again, finally, in uh, subsection E of this part of the zoning ordinance, uh, we recommend uh, inserting text stating that the Planning Commission may limit the height of materials stored based on the nature of the materials, adjacent land uses and zoning districts, visibility and impact on public health, safety, and general welfare. So this <coughs> amendment arises out of the consideration of outdoor storage in the ES district. But really, when we look at it, it should be separate. Uh, regardless of the outcome of uh, the uses permitted or any amendments that may or may not be adopted for the ES district, uh, we think that the outdoor storage screening regulations uh, stand by themselves as a better long-term solution for not just what may be required in the ES district, but all districts in the township. Yes, Mr. Roman. Do you have a question or? No, no questions. I, I was just, if he's, are you finished with your presentation? Yes, sir. I hope, all right. Okay. I just, um, for, well, as a background, I, I was absent at the July 20th meeting, so uh, I didn't have uh, opportunity to speak at that time. Yes. But I wrote down a lot of thoughts. So forgive me if it sounds prepared because it is. And, uh, Please, so if, sure. But I had a, a kind of a different um, view uh, before we get into all the specifics of ES. And I want to preface it that um, I don't have an issue with what's proposed. Uh, in the ES or the screening. I think the screening's a great improvement and it uh, leaves uh, the Planning Commission with more options. So, um, but um, I, hit, I guess um, in reviewing uh, the zoning map, am I correct that this is the only ES district in the township? Yes, that, okay. that's correct. That is correct. Okay, I wanted to make sure because sometimes the maps are not very uh, right. accurate in smaller sections. Um, and, um, I have a, basically a, a different perspective uh, um, on the zoning and it may warrant further discussion. So um, I question how the, the ES requirements were, were arrived upon considering the permitted and conditional uses that were given in the district and the, per, and the purpose indicated um, in the language of ES. So I really question how they arrived at what uses are listed and, you know, in the past. Um, Looking at the district use matrix that was given to us in June by Ms. Hodges, which is very helpful. Um, the uses given in ES reflect the same uses in, in general commercial, um, but limits uses in comparison to, to general commercial. So in other words, the uses that are listed in ES are identical in general commercial, but then there's a whole gambit of uses that uh, wouldn't be allowed in ES. Um, my, so I'm questioning: Was that the intent? Was it was the intent as it as it progressed through through time? Was that the intent to limit all these different uses? Who knows? Uh, but my point is, is is that looking at the excluded uses from general commercial in comparison, I don't see why those uses could not be feasible in the ES district. Um, there's three conditional uses found on page two of that matrix um, that are found in the, in the ES, uh, ES district where they're not found in the general commercial district. And the, those three things are warehousing and material distribution, hospitals, nursing homes, sanitariums, and mini storage. And really, I don't see why those wouldn't be likely found in general commercial districts. And, and actually in other communities you probably do know. I mean, I know of another co couple communities that have those same uses in their general commercial. 
So why these were excluded from general commercial is a good question. Um, but as I stated, I stated before that I, I think we have too many commercial zonings in, in the Northfield ordinance. And perhaps um, it's time to consider eliminating this ES district or even, you know, instead of uh, uh, entertaining more changes to it to make it more complex, um, that we uh, roll it, roll the district into general commercial. And it, I'm, I'm just talking off the cuff. I don't know if it's doable, possible, all the details. But to me, um, this would um, not only remove um, unnecessary restrictions on that district, but it also promotes interest in that. It's a very visual corridor in our township. And I think if we opened it up to more uses, there's gonna be more possibilities for, for future uh, redevelopment, new development, et cetera. And, and really, it's, it's such a, uh, you know, I, uh, it, there's such a mix of uses now there. I don't see why it doesn't, why that whole section just couldn't be rolled into a general commercial. So I, I'd like to know what my fellow commissioners think and uh, uh, Mr. Sloan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Roman. I, I do know that uh, one thing, uh, Mr. Sloan and I went for a drive <laughs> uh, through the district and, and certainly the district as it's written is what was envisioned it certainly is not what's there uh, because what's there is almost predominantly not what the ordinance calls for um, in, in many of the many instances uh, there's a lot of violations of what we would intend to have there uh, but um, I'm going to ask Mr. Sloan to address uh, Mr. Roman and then I'm going to go to Mr. Aquento uh, that, that is a discussion that, that does come up when we have, uh, in, in any community where you have a district that is uh, similar in nature to some other districts. Uh, the ES uh, area is uh, fairly unique because there is a wide range of uses in the district. And I think that the ES was most likely created to try to uh, fit in the, the uses that are there and maybe encourage some uses that are not. Um, so I think with... Um, Part of the discussion starting uh, a few months ago revolving around whether to have outdoor storage or not. If we have good screening regulations and we're generally happy with them and we don't mind having outdoor storage along US 23 under certain circumstances, um, with good screening regulations, that, that item can go off the table a little bit as long as we're satisfied with it. And then the next one would be um, if we're considering the general uh, commercial district, for example, uh, we would just look at the uh, permitted and conditional uses in the general commercial district um, that we could potentially see in the current ES district. They may be uses that we want, maybe uses that we have concerns about, uh, maybe uses that in this particular area we may want special uses. We would just have to go through them one by one just to uh, speculate a little bit in terms of if we have something like, you know, one of these things across the street, um, is it permitted or conditional, and how do we handle it? Um, I think for the most part, something like that could be reconciled. And then um, on the flip side of it, there are currently uses uh, in the ES district that we would have to consider uh, amending to make part of the general commercial district. Uh, for example, um, in the ES district, conditional uses include uh, mini storage, um, nursing homes, and uh, warehousing and material distribution centers um, within an enclosed building. Uh, the warehousing and distribution would probably not be a big deal because that is uh, permitted in general commercial. Uh, but for a nursing home and mini storage, um, those items are not, or those uses are not permitted in general commercial. So part of that discussion would be, are these uses that we want to bring into the general commercial? Um, if so, uh, we'll look at other general commercial areas of the township to see where else we could potentially get these uses. And if we don't, and we want to make it general commercial anyway, then we just have to think about the prospect of making a uh, land use, a legal non-conforming conforming property. Um, so there's a lot of different options on the table as we consider that. Um, nothing that is insurmountable. Uh, it happens all the time in every community. It's just a process that we would have to go through to make sure that we're accounting for all the uses. Uh, fortunately, in the ES district, we're only talking about a dozen or so properties. So uh, the scope is fairly narrow in terms of what will happen from property to property. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. Mr. Iquento? Uh, yes, three topics within all of that. One, the variable for the fencing, to me, 
needs to be considered as well because like as an example if you're storing uh, trailers vehicles boats motorhomes you don't need the uh, landscaping plus the fencing fencing should just suffice that's the first comment I would definitely be in favor of eliminating the ES district and going into general commercial I think we one of us made that comment in July if I recall that discussion um, and nursing homes where do you see them in other communities in their zoning uh, nursing homes uh, generally um, they are in multifamily districts occasionally they'll be in commercial districts um, sometimes in residential districts depending on they're usually uh, uh, conditional uses um, but you can find them in almost any district usually okay. not in agriculture or uh, industrial but any districts in between it's pretty so common. it wouldn't be unheard of to see it in a general commercial oh zone. not at all okay no. so I mean it would and again going forward they would be grandfathered in but going forward it could be easily a conditional use in general commercial ad added correct yes okay Thank you, Mr. Aquino. I do have a question for Ms. Chockley, <laughs> um, because I know Ms. Ms. Chockley has a tremendous amount of experience on this board and was chair, I believe, during the times that there were some pretty significant changes to Enterprise Service District. And I don't know if you recall or not what the thought process was, was going through there, because it, it, on its surface, I'm agreeing with Mr. Roman and Mr. Iquento on eliminating the district potentially and going to general commercial. I just don't want to do. I don't want to go down that path if there's something we're missing. If there was a thought process that occurred that maybe we're not considering right now. I don't. I don't know if you remember that or not. Well, but it, I recall we were mic we were eliminating the residential office, not the enterprise service. We were con combining them. And we didn't want to have um, a huge impact on any residences that might still uh, exist in that area. Um, so that's why we didn't go, f you know, full bore toward the uh, general commercial. Um, so if if that's all your question, I have a few things that I would like to. Yeah, bring. that that was my question. I, okay. I appreciate that. And now I'll turn the floor okay. over to you. Um, so I took a look at the master plan for that whole area, and that's mixed use. And, um, you know, so how does enterprise service fit with mixed use? And then I took a look at the master plan and what it says for mixed use, and it says any use which requires the need for outdoor storage is not compatible in the mixed use designation. So here we have a lot of businesses that have outdoor storage, and the mixed use, it's all mixed use along there. So we have a lot of it. And um, so my concern is, you know, that we, we're moving further away from what the master plan would call for for that area if we, now we're sort of sanctioning outdoor storage kind of all over the place. So um, that, that's my concern about the master plan and the mixed use there. And the outdoor storage that we have, um, I'm concerned about just going with the trees and, and then why you know, we're, we're concerned about the look of fences over time, and but we're planting evergreen trees that die. We're not good about enforcing anything as far as, um, you know, screening. Um, I look at the mini storage, the stop and store down there, and we required trees out on along US 23, you know, f to screen. I don't think there's a tree out there. You know, there, there's just no uh, enforcement of those kind of things, and there's no enforcement, it seems like, of, of what they can store out there. You know, cause we have a lot of trailers, and the, the big deal was they could park their U-Hauls two to three up front. Well, they've got boats and skidoos. I just walked down there, uh, you know, or things like that all out there now. It's not, <coughs> and, and the parking is not where we designated on the site seems like there's parking all over the place of, of vehicles. So I'm concerned about us being able to monitor or um, manage uh, the violations that we have. You know, when, when, we, when we approve a site plan, it's a good faith, you know, kind of a agreement with the owner that that's what's going to happen. And then over time, it just seems to 
fall by the wayside. Um, as far as um, you know, cyclone fencing or whatever that is out there um, that you can see through, um, that's not really screening as far as I'm concerned. And if you're storing cars and boats and things, that's not helpful, except it might keep people out if they're going to vandalize it. So that's not the reason we're having fencing. Um, it's for screening. Um, so those are all my comments about it. I am, I am concerned, right. though, about um, the vast amount of just kind of storage out there and, and the quality. I mean, it's not even orderly out there. So, Thank you, Ms. Tucker. I'm going to go to Mr. Roman and then to Mr. Iquento. Yeah, I, there's, um, I think no matter what, there's always a, uh, an enforcement standard that can always be improved upon. But um, the good thing that I saw um, in, the, in the actual text on this regarding the, the evergreens was that um, it does say that the, they would be eight feet in height, space 15 feet on center at time of planting. So that, that's a big difference. Um, as compared to the example that that you said uh, about the mini storage, I mean, you could put in some sprigs and maybe, you know, make the make the the minimum necessary for the ordinance. But I'm, I'm I was glad to see um, the time of planning. It's, I think it makes a huge difference, and it does talk about maintaining of that too. So I think it's a little stronger language than we've had in the past. I agree, Mr. Triquento. I do remember when we were addressing the stop and store that we did approve the parking that he has for storage in the back area, um, all of those angled in. I mean, I, I know that for a fact. I can remember we did that. Um, I don't remember how many we approved up front, but I do remember those in back along. Only on um, the north side. Right. And that's where they are being. Well, that's where I've seen them when There's you drive by the highway. Boats. But and yeah, we approved you know, X amount of parking spaces there for storage. And then I know he did plant, I can remember us dealing with modifications to the trees of doing shrubbery and other things. And I know I have seen a number of those items there. But again, that is an enforcement issue or review issue um, you know, after uh, the site plan. It, it's getting a little chilly in here. Is it possible to turn the air off? Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Sloan. Uh, in, in light of uh, the things that Ms. Chockley brought to bear, um, I understand the uh, sensitivity and adherence to the master plan in residential areas. My, my question is, is do you see something like this very often where, um, I mean, you have an area that is very commercial slash almost industrial in nature at times um, that is going even further that direction with the new businesses and stuff that have gone in there. Um, that, that area has not gone in the direction of the, what we've planned it to be in the master plan. How do you address something like that when you've got a situation like that? I mean, your master plan is for mixed use there, mm -hmm. but when you look at it, I mean, I, th I, think, I think a change in that area is not as a dramatic of an impact as if you were to have a variation, consist a considerable variation in the residential areas of a master plan. Can you kind of address that a little bit? Uh, sure. It, it would. Uh it would certainly be uh, a major part of that discussion in terms of the policy of the master plan and what the master plan envisions. Um, if the, the master plan envisions mixed use, and the enterprise service district to a large degree is a mixed use district. Um, there's no outdoor storage that's permitted in the district through either special use or as a permitted use. Um, so right now the, the district is uh, in large part fulfilling the goals of the master plan. Uh, the question that comes up is, um, aside from the outdoor storage or um, other things in the mixed use di district that, that don't apply, is whether that area um, is fulfilling the goals of the master plan in terms of 
you know, having uh, businesses move in and thrive and, and meet those other goals. Um, so it's, it's worth looking at to say, uh, you know, at the time the master plan was written, um, have things changed since then or are there any different conditions in the area that would warrant um, either allowing outdoor storage as a conditional use or doing something else to fulfill the goals of the master plan or if it's worth looking at in the master plan to see if this area should be classified for some other use. Um, like you said, if the mixed use, what was envisioned, if it's not happening there and it doesn't look like um, there's a prospect of the mixed use district envisioned by the master plan, then we have to think about what is something realistic that we'd want to see. Ms. Chockley. But perhaps with the limited ability of the ES district uh, to um, attract a variety of businesses, perhaps general commercial is a better, a better fit for that whole area. You get a wider range of businesses able to, to site in there, and then that may be helpful in fulfilling the, the uh, mixed use um, designation that we have it at. Thank you, Ms. Chalkley. I, 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 I understand uh, wh where you're going there. The, the, the thing that, well, we, we allowed the expansion of a use in the district that contains more outside storage. With what we did, um, it could be argued that the current zoning is achieving the goal with uh, the electric company going in across um, and the alarm company going in. Um, but those are two large pole barn. I mean, I mean they are, and they're, they're large, but I mean they 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 are not outside storage. They are different uh, types of use. So it could be argued that the current zoning is achieving that goal. Um, the real question I think we would need to deliberate is: uh, Can general commercial zoning in that dis in the, in, of those properties achieve the goal of the master plan in it being a mixed use uh, area? You know, from a professional planner standpoint, can can you see a mixed use area being achieved through a general commercial zoning? Uh, sure. Uh, a lot of it is uh, just based on um, supply and, and demand. Um, you know, it's a, it has a, it's adjacent to US 23. It has uh, interchanges to the, to the south and the north. There's a mix of uses along uh, the corridor from residential to office uh, to institutional. Uh, so I think that, and, and based on the list of uses allowed in the general commercial district, it, it does allow for mixed use to happen. Even if you think general commercial, you may have two general commercial districts on opposite sides of the township and they look dramatically different based on the market forces there. Um, with the item of the outdoor storage, uh, which we would, we would discuss in more detail in terms of how it applies to the master plan, um, when the master plan is written, um, uh, to, to prohibit outdoor storage, there are a lot of reasons. There's the site of storage, there's the sound, there's the disorganization, and at the time the master plan was written, um, we had the existing outdoor storage regulations on the books. So a lot of the concerns in terms of looking over the fence, over the wall, not having screening, only at the discretion of the Planning Commission would have been a major concern. Um, if, and that, that brings us back to the proposed screening requirements. If we think that we're doing something in the zoning ordinance or even something that applies to this specific area to mitigate some of the off-site impacts that we see of outdoor storage, in some ways, um, not that we're 100% in agreement with what the master plan is saying, but we do acknowledge the objections with outdoor storage and we're doing what we can to mitigate them to make it more viable for mixed uses to happen. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. Um, in light of that, what, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to see us go down a path of potentially eliminating enterprise service, consolidating those properties into general commercial, but I really want to see, uh, I, I really like what you've done with the screening aspect of things, with, with uh, the discretion, with the, uh, the large plantings that would really be uh, staggered to, to create a, a more natural barrier than a, 
you know, block wall or a, a stockade fence or something of that sort. Um, but I'd like to see that work and that brought before us for us to review, consider, um, you know, and, and include some definition of how we would deal with that outside, you know, storage. I mean, a lot of it's done here that can be carried over there, but um, is that, what, what are your thoughts as fellow commissioners? Mr. Roman? I, I agree. I think the, uh, I think it's a good step for the screening. <laughs> I think that, sh like you said, should continue. Um, as I said about the ES, I think we ought to look further into it, uh, at least. Okay. Does anyone have any concerns about that? Oh, no, Ms. Chick? Actually, um, real quickly, I think that um, if you look at the purpose, or part of the purposes of the general commercial district, uh, general comparison retail service and repair business activities which serve the entire township and surrounding area located along major transportation networks. That's what we've got there already. So it seems like a no-brainer to me. And I do like the screening with the evergreens. I think that's a really great idea. Mr. Sohn, so it, it, it seems as if we, I mean, if you'd like a motion, I don't know that we have to make a motion, but we'd like to go down that road. So if you could prepare uh, for us and you and I will work on when to bring it back. So do you sure. have a clear understanding of what we're looking for? Yes, um, we'll, we'll do an analysis of what, uh, what it would uh, be like if we were to um, take the ES, get rid of that district, and in this area make it uh, general commercial and looking at a lot of the things that we discussed tonight, questions, concerns that are raised, and what we might do to address those concerns. Uh, first and foremost, those uses in the ES that we may want to bring to the general commercial, where else in the general commercial districts those uses could happen, and then um, what uses could we potentially get in this area that are not permitted now that we may have concerns about. Okay, does everyone agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you very much. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item C. Considerations and recommendations for uses and development standards in limited industrial and general industrial districts. Proposed amendments to LI and GI industrial districts for kennels. Uh, Mr. Sloan, if you'd like to go over your findings. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and again, this uh, memo is also dated August 11th that I'll read from. Uh, at the uh, July 6, 2016 Planning Commission meeting, uh, the Planning Commission discussed a memo dated June 29th that included several considerations for recommendations for uses and development in non-residential zoning districts. Uh, so we just got done talking about the uh, ES district and outdoor storage. Uh, another item that was in that memo was addressing kennels. Um, a lot of times these uh, types of things get brought up um, based on existing uses in the township. Uh, that kind of keeps the zoning ordinance as a living, breathing document and keeps us busy working on it to make sure that we're addressing a lot of the needs. Uh, sometimes they come up on their own. Uh, in this case, as a background, the Ann Arbor Dog Training Club is located at 1575 North Territorial Road, and it's located in the General Industrial Zoning District uh, where kennels are not permitted. Uh, therefore, any proposed expansion of the club would be prohibited. Uh, currently, kennels are only permitted in the Agriculture Zoning District. Um, and this is not uncommon for a lot of communities. A lot of communities, especially rural communities, want their kennels out in agricultural and rural districts so that you have buffers and setbacks and, and a lot of open space. Um, but uh, occasionally you see uh, communities uh, that are more suburban and urban. They put them in commercial districts and uh, different places like that. And then also in uh, rural communities, um, they sometimes put kennel uses in industrial districts. Um, oftentimes to allow a wide range of uses in industrial areas, especially in industrial areas that are either in transition or may want to open up the number of uses to uh, increase the chance of getting tenants. Um, a couple of examples of communities that I've worked with that allow kennels in their light industrial or light manufacturing districts are uh, the city of Williamston in uh, Ingham County. Uh, it's a population of about 3,800 and it permits, pet, it permits pet boarding facilities in the light manufacturing district. Um, and they have uh, some of which is located closer to downtown, some of it is located in the outskirts in the rural areas. Another community is the uh, Charter Township of White Lake in Oakland County. Uh, it's a population of about 30,000 and it, it permits kennels in its light manufacturing district also. Uh, so there are some communities out there that I'm familiar with that I've worked with that do allow uh, kennel uses in industrial districts. 
Uh, generally, it can be worked out where kennels and industrial uses make pretty good neighbors um, with uh, noise and, and odor and just the site of activity. Um, neither one usually offends the other as long as they're meeting the general ordinances for noise and as always there's consideration for the neighbors. Uh, so what we've done is <clears throat> we've drafted a, uh, a brief text amendment uh, that would make kennels conditional uses in limited industrial and permitted uses in general industrial. And in any case, because it's a uh, non-residential use and it's a major use of property, the Planning Commission would review um, an application for a kennel should one propose to be established or be expanded. And so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Mr. Roman. Through the chair to uh, Mr. Fink or Mr. Sloan, did, were, did, did the township get contacted by the Ann Arbor Dog Club regarding some proposal or? Yes. Okay, did they have? Okay, uh, that, um, I think that would be greatly pertinent to this conversation, like if we could get a summary of some, I, I mean, this has been on the agenda maybe twice, this is the second time, Pot, I'm, I'm guessing, right? This is the second time, first time? It's really the first time it's been on the agenda. I think that's pertinent to, pertinent to uh, discussion of the whole the whole thing what, what would be pertinent what would what would what would what, what I mean this this just be? suddenly popped up that we're gonna look at kennels in general commercial and general and or light industrial it's, it's uh, I think that again uh, as our previous item agenda, uh, agenda item I think that uh, we deserve to maybe be included into uh, anything that happened or you know any proposals that were made by these people to get a background of why we're discussing this and I think the public should know too. Right. I mean is Ann Arbor Dog Training Club, hold on just a moment, is Ann Arbor Dog Training Club intending to or have plans to expand in the future? They've uh, been uh, a fairly long time uh, resident of the district uh, and, and operated there for some time. I think it would be nice if the Planning Commission just knew if, if, if you know, they had approached the township about expanding and, and found out that this was um, a, a potential obstacle and staff and planner felt that you know, this was an item the Planning Commission may consider, it would be nice if we did know that information. Uh, I'd like to go to Mr. Aquino and then I'll go to Mr. Fink if he has some items. Mr. Thank Quinto. You. Thank you. It, it, it is stated, you know, as a background, you know, so it's stated in there, but it could be a little bit more clear that, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but it, it is stated in there, but it could say for the, for the purpose of uh, they would like to expand, they ran into this issue and noticed this, so this is why we are addressing it. But I mean, it, it is kind of stated in there, that's, so I kind of derive that that's why we are looking at it and addressing it. And then the other part that I have a question of this is, so our general industrial would equate to light manufacturing districts in other communities, is that correct? Uh, the general industrial relates more to a heavy industrial uh, use in another in another, or another community, depending on the particular uses. In some cases, a light industrial in one community may be a heavy industrial in another. You would just have to go down the list of uses and really um, really compare the two. Okay. And, but that, the use of a kennel, so the expansion of that as a conditional use in our general industrial, I mean, it, it does fit then. In many cases it does with the okay. cases permitted Perfect. there in terms of them being next door to each other. Okay. Uh, there would still be the same setback requirements for kennels as they are in the agriculture district. That would not change. Okay. I, I am in favor of this and I'm ready to make a motion if, if, I'm, if we're ready to that point. If you have a motion to make, to hold. I would. Because uh, we're going to have to schedule a public hearing, correct? Yes. Correct. Well, that was my motion yeah. to, yeah. to schedule a public hearing regarding the zoning amendment change. So I, I move that we schedule a public hearing um, at the next appropriate time frame to address uh, the change in the zoning of adding kennel subject as a conditional kennels. Uh, this terminology is a conditional use item 10 would be kennel subject to the requirement of section 36-714 in 
limited industrial district and then also uh, the same terminology for a public hearing in the general industrial district. There's a motion by Mr. Iquinto. Is there support? I'll support so I can talk about it. Can I talk about There's it? There's a motion and support on the floor. Discussion on the motion. Yes, Ms. Chockley. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't know where this came from. We, we tend to, through history, uh, have discovered businesses or businesses are non-conditional uses um, places and then we make adjustments to our zoning ordinance to kind of make them fit. Seems like that's been going on. And um, so, you know, I'm looking at the lists and things like that and, um, and we're talking about doing that with the ES just kind of to make them fit. Um, so I, I looked into this because I didn't know is this kosher to stick them in the general industrial area. And um, I did do some searching on the internet and, um, and there are other counties and they do have their kennels in uh, industrial areas uh, or manufacturing areas. So that's not unusual um, um, that, it, that it happens that way. I just thought it would be important, you know, that all of us would know kind of what background and why, how this came up in the first place. So, um, you know, I, we used to get little reports about applicants who may have come and met so the rest of the planning commission knew what was kind of on the horizon perhaps and we haven't gotten that so i was it'd be nice to to actually have that uh for future i don't have an uh, an opinion a negative opinion about having kennels in the industrial area so that's okay with me but i do want to mention um that like lake county uh, illinois Shelburne County, Minnesota, so this isn't just our, our area, Cumberland County, North Carolina, all have kennels in their manufacturing or industrial areas, which is okay. Um, and sometimes they're permitted if they do not have outdoor runs or they're conditional if they do have outdoor runs. So that's my concern about us putting it in there is that we make sure that the surrounding properties are protected in that it would be not necessarily permitted, but it would be conditional and there would be appropriate setbacks and, and all of that. Um, so those are my many cents worth of um, Thank you, Ms. Chuck. Ms. Chick yeah, and then I just, Mr. Roman. I just want to say it's, it's not atypical or unusual for these things to come before us because of someone that needed something. We've had many things come from us from the ZBA because they've seen um, things that need to be looked at. So um, uh, I understand that as well. But typically, as you said, we get something saying where it came from initially. But um, I also don't have a problem with uh, kennels in the, um, in the general industrial area either. Um, and there, I did re there was something in the RTM, I remember looking at this a while ago, um, and when it had to do with churches coming into the RTM, and it could be really weird, but some churches allow animals, and they also talked about that if you had animals on site, in the, uh, uh, that you had to have them either in kennels or in, in cages that, as a condition. So that, uh, with a dog kennel, I'm assuming that would be a condition as well. Right. Yes, Mr. Roman, please. Did you, I'm sorry, Ms. Chick, did, through the chair, did, did you say your concern about being conditional or permitted? Right. <clears throat> yeah, that was my, my concern was that it being a permitted use and then uh, really have no say on it if it's permitted in general industrial. I really have no feeling either way, but I mean, limited, I would see it being, uh, I would see it being conditional in both, my opinion. Uh, for example, in the township, we have another dog kennel. It's on North Territorial. It's huge. It's beautiful, expansive, tons of room. I'm sorry? Dog house. Is that the dog house? I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, that's quite... A different look than you would look and see in a general industrial uh, zoning. So, my concern is that it's permitted. I think, and then uh, didn't you say some of your examples were conditional? Yeah, they were mostly conditional, um, unless the dogs were indoors. So, I, unless there's examples that you could provide of 
being permitted in you know, can, can I, be, I don't know if there is any I mean can that's it be, a question can it be a permitted use if it's all indoors and not a conditional use if it's not I don't I know. I mean, I don't have a problem you're, with a permitted use if it's if all indoors. Well, if you're taking a vacant piece of property, let's say, and it's permitted, you can do whatever you want. It's permitted. The indoors or not. That's, mm -hmm. that's my concern. Okay. Ms. Oh, Ms. Chockley? Well, it and does say that, that the commission should consider adding this as a conditional use. So, um, you know, so it's allowed as a conditional use uh, as instead of a permitted use. So, okay. Yes, Mr. Roman. Am I, am I correct that the, the, it's proposed being permitted use in general industrial? That's correct. That's not what you, that's not what you're that's not saying. What the memo says. Although that could be the, um, uh, you know, if the motion is to have a hearing, the, you know, it could be uh, proposed that way or amended to have it conditional also in general industrial. Okay. And there may be a safer way of doing it so that every kennel would be a conditional use regardless of the district and you would still have some control over uh, the site development. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of what you said. I'm, I apologize. Sure, no problem. Uh, whether that was in the, the motion, I didn't catch it, but the motion could be amended uh, to state, uh, to advertise it as conditional use in general industrial. That so was my motion, oh, to make okay. it as All conditional right. use conditional in both. Okay. In both? I'm sorry if it wasn't clear, but that no, was my motion. Uh, I'm sorry, through the chair. I, I, yes, I assumed he was uh, making the motion on the proposal, which is. I, the I, proposal I, for the public hearing to make it a conditional use in both applications with that terminology. Okay, I, I misunderstood that as well. That, yeah, that, if, that's, sorry, if, that's, if that's the motion, that may clarify some discussion. I concur with that as well. Um, with that, is there any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, or, yes, Mr. Yes, Roman? well, other than the fact that we don't know what they're actually proposing, I, it, would be, it would be of interest, that's my point. If I may make yeah, a point Mr. of Fink? order, the last time we dealt with this, the, the commission, if I recall correctly, said exactly the opposite. The church came in front of us. We had an issue with the church. The, the church wanted the ordinance changed in order to allow for church operations in an industrial area, and the concern was changing the ordinance for a particular use. In this particular case, we were, did state at the planning commission meetings, and I believe I stated on more than one occasion that a dog facility was requesting, um, a, uh, an ex the, the, uh, a kennel was requesting an expansion of use in the industrial area, and the and ordinance didn't allow that. And I believe I indicated that at the either last planning commission meeting or two or three planning commission meetings ago. The planner, um, to his credit, picked up on that in some of those conversations and presented this to myself and Mr. Dignan in a very... I'm just trying to get his attention. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, presented this to myself and Mr. Dignan in a very sort of transparent way. We really liked what uh, the direction that he was going and so we put it on the agenda. We have been working on an application for applicants to submit directly to the Planning Commission if they wish to change the ordinance in a particular way. This came on the agenda today because um, uh, Mr. Sloan recommended that this was, um, th th this was his thoughts in terms of kind of moving forward some of the issues that come in front of us on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is an example, I'm, I'm struggling uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, it's a tough meeting for me, obviously, uh, and, and criticism is good. Um, I'm just struggling as to, in this particular case, we really do need to look at the ordinance first and the issue of the ordinance first and not a site plan in front of you because then the critique will be we're changing ordinances for individuals. This is. I mean, this, this seems like a very, you know, kind of planning process, kind of by the book planning process. I'm just, I'm missing 
the direction that the commission wishes us to go moving right. forward. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Let me provide some clarity and then I'll go to Mr. Rotman, okay? Um, I do recall several weeks or several meetings ago that the, the issue did come up, the question was raised, and um, Mr. Sloan did, did catch that. Um, it, was, it was put on our public agenda, future agenda items that's out on, the, out on the site, that's out there, and we put things on there when we believe they're going to find their way to this, at least I, I try to put them on there when we believe they're going to find their way to this board at some point in time. Uh, Mr. Sloan came and said, I've prepared something. It was prepared in time for the agenda that we had here today. I said, well, then let's put it on the agenda. We, we agreed, and that's why it was brought on the agenda today, because it had been prepared, and it was something that uh, had, had been raised. It's, um, there, there was no formal agenda item of this in the past that said um, this is going on. It was uh, an understanding that this was coming, and and that there was there was a concern there so I don't know if that provides any more clarity but mr. Roman I'll put give the floor to you yeah in in response through the chair I don't always recall everything that was said at a meeting hence the importance of written documentation sent to the Planning Commission I may have been absent there's there's two people absent tonight uh, I don't always check the board that Mr. Dignan's speaking of. Um, and so then we get a one-time proposal of an ordinance change. Haven't discussed anything of it yet. On the agenda, we're looking for recommendations uh, and we're sending it along. It seems fast-tracked. I mean, that, I'm just giving you what it, it appears to me, and I'm sure it appears that way to others. I think that's a necessity of doing better on the background and history and summaries and actually receiving them. So I just want to make that point because I'm sure there's other people that may see it the way I do. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Roman. Yes, Mr. Sloan. Um, and on that point, um, what, what I know about the background, I know that the training club exists at that site. Um, I've, I've heard of a proposal for the training club to either expand or do something different. I haven't seen any particulars of it. I don't know what their plan is. Uh, but what I know is that currently they're non-conforming, so they wouldn't even be able to come in to make an application. And so it didn't, it, 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 uh, they started the discussion, but it hasn't driven the discussion. Uh, what it does, what it has done or is it's raised an issue of as a policy question for the township, uh, should we uh, allow the kennel uses in industrial districts, not just for the benefit of the one that we know about, but for anyone that may want to establish in, in an industrial district. So um, this is a township-wide discussion, or at least um, within all of our industrial districts. Uh, another item is that without the benefit of seeing a site plan or knowing the details about the proposal, uh, I don't even know if they would meet the kennel standards. Uh, it may turn out that should the amendments be adopted and they come in and they don't meet the setbacks or they don't meet uh, any other uh, conditions of the kennel requirements, they would be treated like any other applicant where either the application would be denied on those grounds or uh, they would go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and seek a variance and try to meet those standards. Um, so although it's the... Uh, the uh, training club that uh, started this discussion, there's no guarantee they would be approved even if these amendments were adopted. Um, this kind of acknowledges that they would be um, allowed in that district should the amendments be adopted, but there's no guarantee that expansion would be allowed if they didn't meet the standards. Um, and then it also looks at other industrial areas of the township where this use could come up. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. Ms. Chackley. And I do think it's appropriate for businesses to come in and ask those kind of questions when they feel something is, is not appropriate. And um, perhaps we could have made some changes in the past for other businesses where, you know, for D and G, Nature's Way, for instance, where we didn't really have any other place for them to exist other than where they did out on, I guess it's Earhart or something like that. But if, if businesses and the public even, residents, feel there's something amiss, 
or something that we should take a look at anyway, I think it is totally appropriate for them to come and ask those kind of questions. So um, while at first look I thought, well, what's a kennel doing in a general industrial? But when I did some more research into it, it seemed appropriate um, that it should be considered there. And so I'm glad we're actually taking a look at it. And um, and I think you know we'll be, we'll be better off for it when um, our residents and our businesses participate more fully in what we do here. So, thank you, Ms. Chocley. We do have a motion on the floor to schedule a public hearing for uh, changes to limited industrial and general industrial, a conditional to add kennels as a conditional use. Uh, if there's not any further discussion, uh, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. All right. Next item on the agenda is D, discussion of goals and objectives. I asked for this to be added to the agenda. Mr. Be I'm sorry. Mr. Chair. Mr. Fink. Yeah. One question. On the issue of, because this came up in the past, um, we created a form and an application for individuals when they wish to have a development that's not in conformance with the zoning application. Um, and, or the zoning code um, in order to uh, have a more transparent process given the concerns and issues that were addressed uh, with, in particular, living water. Can we um, discuss this at comments to, for commissioners? I have a question here in a second. Okay, it's just we're in the middle of business. It is part of the business. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. Um, so the question is, uh, does the Planning Commission wish to, we have a fee structure set up for that, does the Planning Commission wish to waive that fee structure for the issue of kennels, or is that fee structure, uh, or is those fees on the kennels uh, and Mr. Sloan's time in redoing the ordinance going to be billed to the, uh, to the Ann Arbor Dog Club? I have indicated to the Ann Arbor Dog Club that there is a likely possibility that they would be responsible for those fees. So I just want some direction so that I'm not in error with the Planning Commission's wishes on how to proceed, particularly with the Ann Arbor Dog Club. Thank you, Mr. Fink. Uh, Mr. Aquinto? I do not feel it's proper to bill them for his time. We're looking at changing our zoning, admitted, zoning uh, allowance, allowments in the township and so just because they brought up the question, hey, you know, can we do this? I don't feel it's right to bill a business for that purpose. Um, that's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Aquinto. Um, I, I mean, that would be an after the fact type thing. I mean, they, they came before us. They didn't make a formal application. There's not a, I, I don't know how we could bill them for something that we uh, decided to undertake. They were the process of making a formal application. Okay. Again, no, that's a, that's a valid concern. I'm again challenged by this. Do we, are, 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 when these kind of things come up, the, the last time we had this conversation, it was very clear that my, the last time this conversation came up, it was very clear that the Planning Commission wished there to be a formal process. They were in the, in, in the midst of going through that formal process and that there was going to be fee structure set up with in, in relationship to that. If, Is that still the Planning Commission's wishes or? Is uh, I'm, that I'm, not the Planning Commission's wishes? I'm going to give you my opinion. I think it is the Planning Commission's wishes. Um, th if, that, if that was a process, sh that process should have been followed through, and that shouldn't have been here tonight. But if we accelerate something and bring something before us before we have an application, I, I don't see how we can go and then charge them for something that we decided to accelerate. I, I, I just I don't know how you can do that. And, and you know, um, it had you know, were we more expedient in doing so? Or I guess we were, but that again, um, maybe this maybe shouldn't have been before us before then. Then I I I, I didn't yeah, realize that. 
if that's my responsibility. I've had a rough meeting tonight. No, 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 no. I'll take the, that on myself. Mr. Fink, it's my responsibility Mr. Fink, please. There's no, there's, there's no inference of <laughs> no, any no, kind. No, 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 no. I'm being serious, though. But there's no inference of no, any I'm kind. Serious. We're just having a discussion here, and I think that, you know, you know, when I go in and they say payment is due at time of service, you know, at uh, 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 time of service, uh, you know, payments due, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I can go to the doctor and, and then be told later, oh, yeah, by the way, you got to pay. Yeah. Uh, I was going to speak and then I wasn't going to speak. <laughs> but then you spoke for yourself. But the, the, the timing issue is you. I mean, you know, I mean, we're pushing this through ahead, right? So that, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, we did. We chose to move it ahead. We don't know if they're going to do anything. They might not. But if they do, that's not on them that, to pay for this. I can't see how it could Hence be. Hence the, as I've been saying, the documentation is missing. Ms. Chockley? Yeah, I, I think it's up to us to say what is going to, well, what should be charged for it potentially. I mean, if, if a resident comes in and they have a suggestion for something, they should go ahead and fill out a form and, and we may be presented without a whole lot, without any planning, you know, to say they might, they might want a business that makes tutus out in the ag area or something. And um, we could say, well, maybe we need to look at that or maybe we don't need to look at that. But if, if the Planning Commission as a, as a whole sees a value in something, then I, I don't see that they should be charged for it. If it's something really unusual that doesn't appear to be, um, it, that's going to take work or something that, that we don't believe is necessarily gonna end up making any difference, um, then it might have to be looked at with a charge, because we could have hundreds of suggestions come in here, and some, some of which are good and some of which are not good. You know, the Supreme Court doesn't take all the cases they get presented, you know. So, I mean, we, we do have to, to be reasonable with our time. So, you know, that's a long answer to kind of a, a dilemma, but um, I don't think we should be charging a lot of money to our residents if they have a good suggestion. Thank you, Ms. Chockley. Mr. Roman, nothing? Or, okay. Yeah, so in, in short, if they come in and apply and go through this process, yes. If they come in and it's something that we look at and administratively it's decided that that needs to be before the Planning Commission uh, in, in a fashion that's different than the process, then I don't see how we can extend that charge to the, to the applicant. Um, can we move on? Item D, discussion on goals and objectives. Uh, again, uh, I wanted to bring this before because in, in spending some time in reviewing our goals, objectives, and our last uh, eight months of uh, planning commission meetings, one thing kind of has become clear to me, and that is while we might have 11 items on our goals and objectives, the way we've chosen to address the goals and objectives have been in, in clusters, in groupings. Um, business oriented zone and main street concepts was kind of consolidated into one that's going to spur into several items that we're going to talk about um, you know our, our third item was land use analysis um, we kind of had a discussion about that and about kind of the value of whether or not a build out was was a value of not I mean we went back and forth a bit a couple meetings ago about that and had discussions. But as I look down at four, five, and six, um, what I see is things that have, that are very intertwined and connected. And, and it is uh, AR densities, AR surveys, and economic impacts in PDR, TDR. And one of the things are, all three of those things affect each other, in my opinion, uh, to, to a large extent. Uh, whether that's greater or less density, whether that's, um, you know, the, the, the true economic impact of uh, farming um, and whether or not PDR, TDR is, is uh, feasible or even viable in this community. W with that, I wanted to bring before uh, the Planning Commission an idea of setting up an ad hoc committee of two of our members and three members from the public 
and I wanted to have a discussion about that. Um, you know, and I and I don't know. You know, my thought process is maybe a Hamlet member, so someone from the rural area in the south, and someone from the rural area in the in the east or southeast area. Um, I wanted to throw that on the table. I wanted to get some feedback and thoughts on your guys' part. I don't see a reason to hold this up. One of the things that um, I really wanted to see us do is very aggressively attack our goals and objectives. And this is a way of us getting to the halfway point on our goals and objectives. I think we have the capacity on our plate to do this. And I think that a committee could be beneficial in taking some of the initial um, steps to bring before a recommendation to this board. Yes, Mr. Iquinto. Will the goals and objectives of this committee be spelled out to them so that they're not floundering? To me, I'm in favor of the, is as long as goals and objectives are clearly spelled out and expectations so that they're not wasting their time. I, I think that is absolutely something that's critically important. Um, that's something, and I haven't talked to Mr. Sloan about this, but, but I'd like some input uh, from, from him uh, as well on, uh, you know, when you, when you have an ad hoc community committee like that, uh, you know, you, you need to tell them what you're asking them to do. Right. Um, and, 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 that's and, why I'm and you know, to throw out those three items and say, go to it, that doesn't accomplish no. anything. Um, to, to have them truly uh, take a look at uh, PDR, TDR, and the surrounding communities and how it's worked and how it can work in cooperation with uh, more regional authorities such as the Green Belt, to, to look at the agricultural, agricultural survey and the economic impacts. Um, I, think, I think those things can be, can be defined in a way that uh, the committee could provide back good analysis on those items. Yes, Mrs. Chockley. Um, yeah, it could be quite a long-term um, mm -hmm. evaluation. Uh, if they're taking on an agricultural survey by themselves, it could take some time. And, um, as there, and then there might maybe some staff require mm -hmm. implements, and is there any funding for that? So, um, well, I think it's a great idea. We, yeah, we should have the parameters there for, um, for that group. And I know there are individuals out in our community who are already doing some of that uh, work on their own. So um, maybe it, it wouldn't be as long as, or as labor intensive as might immediately be um, um, evident. Well, what, what I would propose we would do is, um, Mr. Fink? Do you have something to add to that? I don't want to interrupt, but I No, I have please to, do. Please go ahead, Ed. You're fine. I think this is a good idea. I think it should be done, and I think that should be, um, uh, I think uh, it should be a formal request from the Planning Commission to the Board of Trustees, and the Board of Trustees should authorize it. And they should be the ones, uh, I think the Planning Commission should, in, in exactly the same way as the Parks and Rec Board, uh, presented to the Board of Trustees. I think the Planning Commission should create a process and create a proposal for the number of people on that committee and who those individuals consist of um, and then um, uh, have that uh, process and in, in, uh, committee approved by the Board of Trustees in a formal way. Thank you, Mr. Fink. Uh, that, that was my intent as well, uh, Ms. Chick. And it is a process, and uh, I agree that you can't just throw people together and say, go do it. They have to have guidelines and steps, and this is how you accomplish this to get to this end. So we need to have that before they start on their project. Okay. Mr. Sloan, is that something that you and I can work together and bring something to this board so that we can work constructively together on uh, making a formal proposal to the Township Board on uh, what we envision here and ask for them to consider it and they're gonna have to allocate budget for it obviously um, yeah absolutely we can um, you know put this on a, a future agenda or even the next agenda there may not be much to prepare just to kind of dig out the old goals try to consolidate them get a discussion you know we'll have time between now and then to kind of think about what each person may want to include with the uh, duties and the charges 
and then um, you know have a good discussion at the next meeting and kind of go forward from there. Um, you know, if there's a formal committee, even if it's an ad hoc committee, um, it could ultimately end up on uh, number nine under the agenda is a recurring thing of every agenda when we go through the committees hearing from the representative or representatives of that committee just to see what's new are they doing the things that the planning commission and or township board want them to be doing so it could be a, a recurring discussion oh and while this is in the early stages i mean i i, I mean i i'll venture to solicit from the community if you have thoughts ideas um processes resources any of that information that you want to share with us as we start to venture into this, uh, please feel free to share it. Send it to the office. The office will distribute it to, to the commissioners. Um, you know, that information is going to be valuable. I know there are members in our community that have done a lot of work in this area that have uh, relationships that could benefit uh, a committee like this. Um, you know, while we are uh, still short of asking for individuals that want to serve on this we will get to that point eventually um, ideas and information and scope is something we're going to be working on and any information anyone from the community can provide would be very beneficial so that's why i wanted it on the agenda um, i don't have anything more to add to that uh, there's nothing else we can move on we don't have any new business tonight um, their uh, next item is approval of the preceding minutes from the august 3rd meeting I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as Support. presented. It's a motion by Dignan, supported by Aquento. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next uh, item is final call to the public. If uh, either of the members of the public would like to address the board, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> welcome, Mr. Gordon. David Gordon, Helena Road. Uh, thank you for starting to do something about farmland preservation. I really appreciate it. A lot of other people in the community appreciate it too. Um, I know that Ms. Hodges put together a very nice uh, plan for the uh, Van Curler property presentation there. It was very professional. I would welcome seeing anything that our new planning consultant uh, might bring to the table regarding the process that would be required to uh, to get to a committee that actually has some uh, specific goals and objectives, that would be great. Um, just as an aside, you were talking about certificates of occupancy. Um, I know I had to get one when I built my house. This room is very nice, but all the outlets, nearly almost all the outlets, don't have any plates on them, which I believe uh, a building inspector would, would insist upon. Might be something you want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any, no, you're good? It's just not going to be a full meeting. <laughs> okay. Next item is comments for commissioner. I'll uh, start, count commissioners, I'll start with down here. Mr. Roman, anything? None tonight, thank you. Ms. Chocley. I think it was a very productive discussion. I mean, it's finally stuff's out there, and I think it's good for the public to hear us. Absolutely. Mr. Mm -hmm. Iquinto. Uh, just that uh, everyone have a very enjoyable, safe holiday that's coming forward on Labor Day. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Che. Okay. In, in the absence of uh, Mr. Sanalicho being here, I'll ask you to keep all of our men and women in uniform uh, in your thoughts and prayers and uh, have a good night. Uh, announcement of our next meeting. Oh, yes. Our next meeting will be on September 7th. 2016. Motion to adjourn. Support. Motion of support to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried.